Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome to Money Table Talk. Today is April 29th, Thursday, and we are in the midst of Financial Literacy Awareness Month, which is April, you guys. So glad you guys are all here today. Our Money Table Talk is sponsored by Project 1000 Mission, where we got to this our goal in a calendar year to help a thousand people have a strong financial foundation. And so today, you guys, you guys are going to have to be in for a treat because you guys, we have a guest speaker here today that's going to help us to build that strong financial foundation. I Means you guys have been asking about, you know, when we're going to talk about real estate <laughs> and about investing. Well, you guys, we got somebody good for you guys. Okay. So uh, today, you guys, our special guest speaker is Mr. Steve Peterson. He is the broker owner of Infin Infinity Investments where they do residential, you guys, as well as commercial real estate, okay? So you guys, today, we're gonna to talk about investing, okay? And, and you guys, investing in multi-units. So I'm gonna have Steve tell more about himself, you guys, but I just wanted to say, um, you guys, what I love about Steve, you guys, I met Steve, gosh, maybe about a couple of years ago or something like that. Yeah. And what I love about you guys is that Steve, you guys, is really, you guys, dedicated to educating you guys, our people, on how to invest. I mean, you guys, he has multiple um, webinars that he gives you guys for free to people. Okay, but you guys, it is, you guys, that's his passion, you know, that, that's his mission, you guys, to help us learn how to invest in multi-units, okay? So Steve, I am so happy to have you here today. And so why, why don't you take over and kind of like tell, tell us about yourself and a little bit about, you know, investing in multi-units. Well, thank you, Yved. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate y'all having me on this. Um, uh, and what you're doing with the prize is Project 1000, right? That's what, that's what we call it. I mean, you told me about it a little while ago. Um, you know, I was really excited about it because a big part of, you know, what I do individually as a broker, as an investor, as an entrepreneur, but also as a realtor, um, member of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers is to educate, empower, inspire and influence our people to move towards building wealth through uh, the ownership of the ownership and the business activities around rental and rental properties and commercial properties. And so that's, that's kind of my niche. Uh, what I do uh, a little bit about myself is a uh, broker owner of infinity investments. Uh, we're a commercial real estate uh, brokers and investment firm. I started the company in November, 2009. Uh, I've been in the business though since uh, 2003, so it's been a long. I've seen the good, the bad, the ugly, the the crazy, the ratchet, the you know uh, all of that, and in between. And now we up in this COVID pandemic, so it's a whole nother uh, ball of wax. Um, but I am born and raised in East Oakland. I'm from Brookfield Village, um, and I graduated from Oakland High School. And uh, you know, I, in addition to me running my company, I am also the past president of the California Association of Real Estate Brokers. That's KRAB. Um, and then Associated Real Property Brokers, uh, it's ARPB. Those are, ARPB is the local board uh, and KRAB is the state board of NARAB, um, which is the, uh, the Realtors Organization. We're the Black Brokers Association. A lot of people don't know uh, what a Realtors is um, because back in the day, um, uh, uh, Blacks and other minorities was not able to join the Realtors. A lot of people don't know that. So in 1947, the real TIS was formed as a, uh, a ways and a means for us as a professionals in the business to be able to conduct business and give our people access to properties. Because the MLS used to be a book back in the day. And of course, we, we didn't have access to that book. So you, you know, I mean, y'all know what it is. And um, so that's what the real TIS is all about. And we stand for democracy and housing. So I'm also, though, a CCIM, and that stands for Certified Commercial Investment Member. And that's a designation that you can get, but it's also an organization, a network uh, that you can be a part of. I was the past president in 2018. So I got a, a somewhat of a diverse background in real estate because uh, I'm involved heavy in commercial, but first and foremost, I'm getting down for the people and, uh, and getting this word out um, for our folks. And so I got a presentation for y'all, the intro to commercial and uh, multifamily investing. I'm a blast through it. Um, and- Hi. And whenever, is it, is it that time, Wavesh? Should I get right to it, share my screen, or do we got anything yeah. that, okay. Yes, yeah, get right to it. And then, um, um, Danielle, if we have any uh, questions, can, can you ask, uh, uh, t tell, us, tell us for us, okay? Do you want me to interrupt you, Steve, or do you want me to wait till you're done? Uh, well, however y'all do y'all, I'm, I'm good with whatever. I'm down with whatever. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I've just seen uh, Dr. Roche 
talk about all right now, Brookfield in the house. Dr. Roche, <laughs> I see you. Um, what's good? You know what I mean? We holding it down for Brookfield. So you, however y'all want to do it, whatever, I'm good with whatever. You know what I mean? Okay. I got, okay. You know, so, so however you want to do it, I got a lot of information um, to share, and I'm going to bust down in about 25 minutes. So my presentation typically is about an hour. I'm going to bust it down in 25 minutes because okay. I know I'm in effort for times. So there may be some questions. It might be better to hold it to the end so we can Okay, we'll do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay. But you know, however y'all want to end up doing it, you know, it's good. Okay. One. So I'm going to go on ahead and share the screen right now. Just give me a quick second, and I will pull this presentation up, and we can get rolling. And – Hold on one second. We're going to take it from the beginning. There we go. Can everybody see that? Okay, fantastic. So I uh, kind of just already told you a little bit about myself, um, a little bit about the company. Uh, we did start in November 2009. That was wild. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, I tell people blood on the streets. It was, I did a deal. I, I started my company after I did a deal, 81 units on 68th and MacArthur. And I sold the property. I was working for a broker at that time. I sold the property. It's literally bloods on the street. We was in contract on that building as a Chase REO. I'm going to deliver the tenant of stop was on a Saturday. It's like five police helicopters around the property, right? Um, I couldn't get to the property. I called the manager. like, what's up? Hey, man, uh, four police just got killed down the street. Um, and this was in 2009. I don't know if y'all remember that on, on 74th and MacArthur. Uh, four police got killed right down the street from the police department. So my, that almost killed that deal, but my, my buyer stayed with it. He closed that deal, um, $3.7 million in 2009. That was 40 something thousand per unit. The building's worth 14 something million now. You know what I mean? So he did real good. Saying all that to say, y'all, I started my company after that when it was literally bloods on the street. It was very uh, um, a crazy time. It was a great time to start a company. So I just want to, you know, uh, start with that because we're in this pandemic and we don't know what it's going to hold. But I can tell you one thing is that if we can navigate through it, there's a lot of opportunities. OK, so I'm going to get right to it. Um, for purposes of this presentation, I'm going to mainly be talking about multifamily properties, two or four units. OK, but understand these principles can be applied whether you're buying a single family home whether you're buying two to four units, whether you're buying five plus units, and it is a difference. Two to four units is residential income. The valuations are still primarily residential. The laws are still primarily residential. It, it, that's the consumer world. Once you go five plus, you swim with the sharks, baby. You're in the commercial real estate world because the, the finance, even though it's homes and people's residence, once you go five plus, that is commercial real estate. And so um, for the most part of what I'm talking about, we'll, we'll be talking about that. But understand, though, the principles apply everywhere. However, the reason I like multifamily for a few reasons. Number one, stable cash flow during the time you own it. That's the holding period. Occupancy rates historically are high, uh, even in the worst of times. In, in uh, you know, uh, bad economies, good economies, rates of occupancy typically stay high. Like in, in, in hotels right now, not the case, right? You know what I mean? Retail property is not always the case. Also, financing is available at attractive rates. And many people don't know that FHA, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac are some of the major players in multifamily five-plus unit uh, financing. So the financing, uh, but even from regular banks, the rates on apartments buildings is going to be better than retail properties, hospitality um, office, okay? Um, now, it's a great generator of wealth, but it's also a great preserver of wealth, meaning that if you do have a lot of money, it's a great place, place to put it. But if you don't have a lot of money and you're trying to nickel and dime your way up, it is a great way to move kind of rapidly because you have um, better economies of scale that the single family homes do not have. So just a couple of reasons why I like multifamily. Y'all can decide on your own, but I want to advocate everybody who's listening, whether you're a professional in the business of real estate or in insurance or finance or whatever you do in life to look at this through a lens of an investor. I, I think we all should have real estate, particularly multifamily real estate as a part of your portfolio. And I tell a lot of my clients who only buy real estate, you know, it's good to have some other assets as well. Um, you know, I think insurances are some of the best investments, you know, uh, to, to, to have while you're investing in real estate, but everyone should have a piece of real estate as part of their portfolio. So when you're looking at real estate though, understand something, it don't always go up. All right. No matter what the people are going to tell you, because a lot of people is going to tell you, no, it's going to keep going. It's going to keep going. It's going to look, it's going to keep going. That didn't happen in 08 and 09, did it? 
No, it was, it was all bad. But what happened was in that last market cycle, as a marketplace, we all got away from these fundamentals, the blocking and the tackling. Markets go up, markets go down. Things run in cycle. The principles never change. They stay the same. So these are some of the key indicators that we like to look at. Number one is cash flow. Number two is the net operating. It says NOI. That stands for net operating income and the details around that. Uh, also, the price and cap rate. Cap rate stands for capitalization rate. Uh, and I'll break down what that is. Return on investment and return on equity, as well as cash on cash return and internal rate of return. When we're looking at buildings, you want to use these indicators to help you make decisions. Not just, oh, the building's in a nice neighborhood. It's a good looking building, okay? You buying for, or it's a great school district. You're buying for different reasons than you would buy if it's a single family home, okay? But when you've found a property, so most of what I'm gonna talk to you about is the analysis. What makes a good deal versus a bad deal? How do you determine that, right? Um, and then at the end, I'll talk about some creative financing strategies that you might be able to put in motion if you have limited capital and resources. But it all starts with this. So once you've found a property, what you really wanna begin with is analyzing the gross income, the income, right? you know? And we, we, we do, our own analysis by reviewing the seller's package of information. We wanna look at the seller's rent roll, which is gonna show you all the tenants in the building, how much they pay when they move in, when they move out, what the deposit is. And then we wanna ask the seller for their last two years profit and loss statement. And we're gonna take their actual profit and loss statement. And if it's being marketed, the broker is also gonna give you a pro forma, which means a projection, that's cool. But what we want is the profit and loss statement, the actuality, because we're going to take the actual numbers and we're going to create our own pro forma projection about what it's going to look like when we or our clients acquire the property. OK, so once you get that information, you can calculate the gross schedule rents. That's what, how much rent you could collect if everybody, every unit was occupied and everybody paid their rent. Then you take away from that vacancy and you want to look up whatever you're at you can go to the Institute of Real Estate Management's website, just Google Institute of Real Estate Management, and they will give you numbers for vacancy rates of any major metro area in the United States, okay? So you wanna look at what the market vacancy rate is for that area. That building might be full today when you buy it, but understand, people, even in a good market, people move in and they move out. So you wanna look at what the market vacancy rate is for that area and go to Institute of Real Estate Management, Google it, go to their website. Um, so you take that number away from your rents and then you add to it what's called other income. Other income is simply any other income that you generate that is not rental income. So this could be laundry, vending machine, billboards. If it's a big building, a cable contract, just any other income that you can generate that's not rental. So you add that and then you get the bottom line number of income called the effective, the effective gross income. This is what a building actually uh, collects. Okay. Now, when we're doing these analysis, we do it on an annual basis. That's important. You want to have an idea what your month to month operations is going to look like. But when we do our numbers, we do them annually because that's how we calculate rates of return. That's how we get to our, our capitalization rate. That's, that's important. So when you're busting down these numbers, you're probably going to get some monthly numbers that from the seller that you got to um, put together in an annual, annual figure. All right. Just want to make sure I I'll break that down. Now, once you got your income um, situated, you take away from that by what's called operating expenses. Understand this is not your mortgage payment. This is the biggest mistake that I see even, you know, uh, seasoned investors doing when they're, you know, evaluating property is that they, they, you know, don't look at all the operating expenses. This is the cost of doing business. Like even if you pay cash for the building, there is no mortgage. You're still going to have taxes, insurance, management, maintenance, utilities, reserves, repairs. Um, you're going to have these things even if you pay cash for the building, okay? This is what's called the cost of doing business. Sometimes you're going to have even more than that. You're going to have uh, uh, landscaping, p uh, pest control, other stuff like that. The good, the, uh, that's why you want to get the, uh, the seller's profit and loss statement so that you can look at what they actually spent. Now that what the brokers say you're going to spend, Look at what they actually spent, 
okay so that's why we want to look at those actuals bust them down to create our own projection going in the future okay so we take our effective gross income we take away from that operating expense to get to a very very important number it's called the net operating income and the net operating income is the effective gross income minus the operating expenses it does not take into account what's called your debt service which is your mortgage payments okay this is this is before your mortgage payments come into play. Essentially, net income is after accounting for all income sources minus all non-debt service expenses. Okay, essentially it's what's left after you collect rents and pay your bills, but before you pay your mortgage, okay? Your net operating income is what you pay your mortgage with, all right? It's also the lifeblood of the business. It's the value of the property. And uh, it, it is actually the value of the property because what we do in commercial, anything that's five plus units and above, we're gonna capitalize the net operating income to come up with a value, okay? So what, what does it mean capitalize, okay? So we take our net operating income after we figure out what that is, right? Through our thorough due diligence. And we capitalize it to figure out what the property is worth or what it's going to be worth after we make some moves at, on the property. Okay, this is when we come up with what's called the capitalization rate. In the business, you'll hear people say cap rate. It's capitalization rate. So if you hear that, also understand in commercial real estate, there's a lot of terms. I'm gonna bust down a few of these terms for y'all that when you're talking to brokers, when you're talking to other people in the business, they're, they're gonna be either one or two things, talking fast, moving fast. So they're gonna be using these terms or they're going to be wanting to test you to see if you know what you're talking about because a lot of the commercial real estate people in this business is like that. You know what I mean? Um, they ain't cool and they trying to bust you out to see uh, if you really know what you're talking about or not. So it's important to know a few of these key terms so you can bob and weave, swim with the sharks, okay? Cap rate is one of the most important, okay? Because this is how we come up with the value of the property. Essentially, the cap rate is the rate of return generated uh, by real estate investment property based on the annual net operating income that a property generates. Basically, it represents the percentage return you would get from a building if you paid cash and didn't have a mortgage. Okay, so your net operating income would be your, your return, right? If say you pay cash, you don't got a mortgage, there is no mortgage payment, right? You're still gonna have, like I said before, taxes, insurance, management, maintenance, and so forth. And that net operating income, that's what's called your yield, all right? And the yield is the return, the cash flow return from the property on an annual basis, okay? There's, and the cap rate is the rate, is the measure of that net operating income in relationship to your purchase price and or relationship to the value, okay? And, and, and this calculation, purchase price and value is, you know, is the same thing because now if, you, and now if you're negotiating, right? Like, like now, we're in a market that buyers are beginning, not really yet, but they're beginning to be able to negotiate. The last few years in real estate, if you wanted to get a property, you had to outbid it, bid somebody, or you had to, at least in the Bay Area, that is, I know it might be some other people listening from other areas, the Bay Area, you had to bid, outbid somebody, or you had to find an angle to get to the property before Alibaba and the 40 Thieves saw it, right? Nowadays, you're able to negotiate a little bit. So you can kind of figure out hey, maybe their purchase price don't match up with the value and you can negotiate to get that purchase price down based on your analysis, not shooting from the hip, you know what I mean? So this cap rate calculation is very, very important. Net operating income divided by the purchase price. Let me give you an example, but understand this. When I got into the game in 2003, it took me a couple years to truly get my arms around this concept. So, you know, don't, don't trip if it's not immediately something that you grasp and you can go to my youtube station infinity investments on youtube and i got a few videos where i i, I kind of break this down at length of um this concept of cap rate um so if you you're not really understanding it and i'm going too fast uh tap into the youtube and get some more of that that game on the cap rate but here goes the the calculation just for you know let's keep it simple if a building's net operating income is a hundred thousand and the purchase price is a million right here's our formula Cap rate equals NOI divided by the purchase price. That's the formula. Key thing to understand too, if all you have is two of these numbers, these three numbers are inversely related. Okay, that, sorry, that's an algebra term, y'all. I said, I've been helping these kids with this algebra, um, you know what I'm saying, these last couple of days. So I'm breaking out the algebra, but it's, it's an inverse relationship, 
You understand what I'm saying? If you got two of these numbers, you can solve for the third. So if you're analyzing a property and you're trying to figure out what the cap rate is, you're trying to solve for a cap rate. If you got the NOI and the purchase or the value, you can solve that. If you're trying to figure out, like for me as a listing agent, I'm listing property. I'm not trying to figure out what price I'm going to list that property at. If I got cap rate and NOI, I can get to the property, um, the list price or the purchase value. If I'm trying to figure out what the, what the NOI is, um, like off, you know, I always like to do the analysis I just showed you. But if I'm just talking to somebody over the phone and they tell me, oh, the building is a million dollars. And I say, okay, well, what's the cap rate? And they say, well, it's a, it's a, it's a 6% cap rate million dollars. Well, I know, I know that the net operating income is 60 bands, 60,000. Okay. So these are inversely related. All right. If you have two of the numbers, you can solve for the third, but in this example of cap rate, NOI divided by the purchase price. If so, we said our net operating income was a hundred thousand and the purchase price was a million that would equal a 10% cap rate or 10%. The building generates a 10% return. Okay, outside of the debt, the debt service is something else, all right? But the building itself is generating this, okay? Now, we in the Bay, it ain't too many 10% cap rates anymore, but I will tell you, okay, markets go up, markets go down, they change, it's not always the same. When, you know, when I first got into business in 03, it was, it was similar to this last market cycle, it wasn't no 10% in 09, in 2010, in 11. It was a bunch of 10 percent. OK, so I, I don't think we're going back to that, although the market may soften up a little bit. But understand, that, you know, it changes. And here's the rule of thumb, y'all, with cap rate. The higher, the better when you buy. So you want to buy a cap rate when it's generating a higher return. The lower, the better when you sell. So when you sell, you want to time the market when uh, the cap rates are low. And again, you can go to Institute of Real Estate Management to check out what market cap rates are in any given area and understand when you're buying and selling real estate as an investor, when you as a broker or agent are buying and selling real estate, um, you need to kind of understand where you are in the marketplace. So you want to time it, you know, accordingly, nobody has a crystal ball, but you can see where you are as it relates to the market cycles. And I had, a, again, I have a couple presentations on my YouTube um, station. If you hit that up about market timing. Okay. And I just did one about a month ago as it relates to the market we're in now. So understand the market that you're in or that you're going in, the higher, the better when you buy, the lower, the better when you sell. Okay. So another couple quick terms, net cash flow. When you hear people say cash flow, net cash flow is the cash remaining after all expenses and the mortgage is paid. So once you, you take your net operating income and you pay your mortgage payments, that's called net cash flow, all right? And you determine if that cash flow is sufficient or is a good look um, by analyzing the cash on cash return, okay? And the cash on cash return is kind of what it sounds like. I take my net cash flow, the number we just talked about, and we divide that by the total cash invested. The total cash invested is typically your down payment plus your closing costs. Now, if you pay cash for the building, that would be the price plus the closing costs, okay? Most of us are not paying cash for the buildings. But if we did, that's what it would be. Most of us are going to have a down payment plus our closing costs. That's our cash invested. And so in order to get to the cash on cash return, we take the net cash flow divided by the total cash invested. That's going to get us a number, a percentage. Okay. That, per and I'll, I'll explain what that is in a few, uh, you know, and what's a good um, cash on cash return in a few slides. The internal rate of return is more of an institutional measure. That's more of what the bigger companies and firms look at. But what it essentially is, is the total return on the initial investment on an annual basis once the property is sold. And what I mean by total return is this. Real estate's the best investment for a few reasons. Well, I feel it's the best investment. You know, I, you know, I don't know, it might be some people feel differently, but I feel it's the best investment because number one, you make cash flow. But that's not the only method of return. Every time you make a mortgage payment, and if you're doing it with rental property, you're making mortgage payment with the tenant's money they paying you. Um, you're getting a, what's called principal pay down unless you got interest only loan, but most investment property loans are going to have an element of principal pay down. Every time you pay the mortgage, you're getting a certain amount of the debt being paid off. So that's, a, that's an element of return. Okay. Real estate goes up in value. Um, not all the time, not all the time, but you want it 
to time it so that you're going up in value or you want to hold it over a period of time where the time you bought to the time you're thinking about selling the property went up in value so the up or, or the appreciation or depreciation of the property uh, is also an element of return and then also the tax either benefit or liability is the element of return so the irr the internal rate of return takes all those measures uh, in in the account over a period of time, typically when we analyze this, it's five years, and it gives you a percentage return. Most of us are not gonna use that as day-to-day -day investors. I just want y'all to know what it is, um, so that it, if you decide to look at it that way, or if you're in a conversation and somebody says, oh, this is, what is the IRR you're targeting? You at least know what they're talking about, so you can, buy, you, can you know what I'm saying, uh, get through the transaction, all right? But most of us, we need to look at the cash on cash return. And here's what it is, okay? The annual net cash flow divided by the initial investment. So let's just let's give an let's give an example. Let's say you went out and you bought a fourplex. Let's say you bought this fourplex in 2014. Okay, in the Bay Area, you could have bought a fourplex for 400 or 500 thousand in 2014. I know because I sold a few of them. Um, and let's say you put a hundred thousand dollars down at that time, and let's just say it generated fifteen thousand a year for you net cash flow, which was possible a few years ago, and you know, you did the analysis, so you took 15,000 divided by 100,000. So you took your 15,000 net cash flow divided by 100,000. That got you 15% cash on cash return. Pretty good. Okay, pretty good. Today, you ain't getting that in the Bay. Today, you're getting 5 or 6%, maybe 7%. You can go out to Stockton, maybe get 9 or 10%. If you go out of state, and that's something I'll be talking about in my seminar next week is out of state investing. Certain markets out of state out of the area of the major markets, you, you, you can achieve these type of cash and cash returns. But back in 2014 in Oakland, let's say you could achieve this. All right. So let's say you bought this building and you had 15 percent. All right. Ideally, you want to get double up digit cash and cash, not really attainable in the Bay right now. But here's the rule of thumb with this cash on cash, that element of return. And other people, oh, by the way, that's when we talk ROI, return on investment in real estate. I know in stocks, it's maybe a, di a different, um, in insurance, it's a different measure. But in real estate, the ROI, ROI is in regards to the annual net cash flow. And that's our cash on cash return. That number, that cash on cash, that ROI needs to be higher than your going in cap rate. It needs to be higher than the cap rate that you're purchasing. Um, because you want to make sure you have positive leverage. So if the Cash on cash is lower. Um, that means you have negative leverage. Um, the loan that you have is actually taking away from the property's return. So you want to make sure that your cash on cash is higher than the going in cap rate. All right. Now, let's say you've owned that property since 2014. And now it's uh, 2020. All right. And you're thinking about, well, what are some of my investment alternatives? What are some of the things I can do with my return uh, but with my equity. Okay. So this is when you would analyze your return on equity. This is a measure that most people miss in real estate. I, I think a lot of people do talk about this in the stock market though, because the 100,000 that you use to acquire that property, obviously since that time, the, if you bought in 2014 to 2020, the market value went up significantly. Okay. And so let's just say your $100,000 investment turned into a net equity of $300,000. And what I mean by net equity is this, the value of the property minus the loans and what's called the cost of sale, which is typically five to 7%, the cost to pay your real estate broker and the transfer taxes, okay? That's what's called your net equity. So in order to calculate your return on equity, you would take your annual net cash flow, that same 15,000 number that we said here, divide it by the property's net equity, 300,000. So, so keep it here. Your hundred thousand dollars of cash grew to three hundred thousand dollars of equity. That's why we love real estate, right? Um, and now you're sitting here saying, "Hey, my cash on cash return is doing fantastic. I'm I'm doing great, but my return on equity is actually only five percent." So, and here's the rule on this: ROE, return on equity, typically diminishes as the property appreciates in value. As the value goes up. Your, your equity, meaning you have more equity with typically the same amount of cash on cash return. So in some instances, you, you might get a property and the cash on cash, the income you get blows up because you renovated some units or you got some more units, you built some more units or something happened. You had a low lease in a commercial property and you raised the rent or something like that. But typically, 
ROE diminishes as the property appreciation value. So a lot of clients, Leslie, last year, I, I worked with a lot of deals like this where clients were saying, hey, uh, my property doubled in value. Can I, what can I do? I'm going to advance in the world. You know, make a monopoly, four, four greenhouses, one, one red hotel is a way to win the game, right? You know, so what can we do? So this is a cash flow accelerator example. So if you were to get into the game, you bought one property, and this is how you can truly build wealth if you are working as a janitor, custodian, a, 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 a minimum wage job, because it's not about your earned income. It's about figuring out how to build assets and then let them assets build. And this is how you can really, you know, uh, get wealthy without a lot of resources, okay? It may take time, it may take discipline, it may take patience, okay? But you don't have to have all the bread in the world to, to execute on something like this. So, and I see it's a, it's a few questions popping in there. We will get to them. And I'm, a, I'm trying to get this done in um, uh, 30 minutes. I know we're just like at that point in time. So I'm going to wrap up here. But um, let's say you looked at your property here, we said was 15% cash on cash, you looked at the property, it's only generating 5%. And you said, what can I do? You called a broker like me, we had a conversation. I said, well, maybe we can go out there and do a 1031 tax deferred exchange. I mean, you sell your property and you defer paying the capital gains um, and you take that 300,000 towards uh, and you purchase another property, okay? Now, because you're purchasing a property in an escalating market, the market wasn't like, if you bought in 2014, the prices have come way up. So the problem is if you sell in 2020 and you have to buy in, the, in 2020, the market, you know, the, the, the price points are a little bit higher, right? That's, that's the issue. However, remember, you're not dealing with the same pile of cash you had before. You are dealing with the, the equity, that cash, that hundred grand you invested is now 300,000 in equity. All right. So what happened here is you went out and bought a property, but you didn't get 15% on your cash. Maybe you only got 10% right? So maybe you invested your money and you got, and, and, and truthfully right now, you probably wouldn't even get 10%. You get, you know, um, maybe six or 8%. If you, well, if you invested in Oakland, but maybe if you invested in Stockton, you could get that 10%. But bottom line, for just sake of example, you took your equity of 300,000 and you got less of a return, but because the equity was a higher number, that 15,000 you was making, you're now making 30,000 on your money. So the result would be you have doubled your cash flow four greenhouses, one red hotel. And maybe right now I would say one red apartment building because hotels ain't doing too good right now. You know what I mean? But you, know, you understand what I'm saying? So that, that's a great formula to build wealth. And I got, I'm going to wrap up. Um, I got a couple um, of these slides I'll go over, but I just wanted to say this in closing. Okay. There's many ways to acquire real estate. Um, uh, uh, when I got in the business, I got in the business because I watched a program called Carlton Sheets, No Money Down Real Estate. That appealed to me because in 2003, I was in uh, San Jose State University. I, I had no money to put down, right? So that was how I got involved in real estate. I ordered that course. I like, I lived and breathed through that course. And the big part of what he was talking about in that course of how to acquire properties with no money down is simply using uh, creative financing techniques and other OPM, other people's money, okay, other investors' money or the seller's money. And here's just a couple quick strategies that you can use. Uh, master lease options is the same thing as a lease option. You probably all heard of lease options. Once you go more than one unit, so you got two units, 100 units, we use what's called master lease options to acquire property um, without owning it all the way. Uh, you have an option to purchase it. You have what's called equitable title. So a great way to control property. Uh, then there's land contracts or contracts for deed. Uh, essentially, these are installment sales, very similar to a lease options where you put a little bit of money down or no money down, but you agree to pay the property over installments. And at, at the end of the installments, you, you, you know, uh, pay a amount or all of it and the deed comes to you. It's a great way to get into property with, with low to no money down. Wrap around mortgages. These are mortgages that wrap around existing financing, okay? That's also in California called all-inclusive deeds of trust. Uh, it's where like, okay, I sold a building where in 08, right before the crash, I saved this guy. He had a 650,000 mortgage. We sold the property for 850 and then we created a 750,000 wrap around mortgage. That means he carried back 750,000 that wrapped around 
his existing $650,000 loan. The deed did transfer at closing. So the buyer bought the property. The deed, that's what's different than a lease option or a land contract is the deeds don't transfer in these two strategies until the end. In a wraparound mortgage, the deed transfers at close. So that is different. Here's the thing about it is the, the, the lender who had the existing financing, they don't know about all that, okay? It is a legal transaction, but a lot of lenders have what's called due on sales clauses within their notes. So if they do find out about it, the risk is they could call the loan. They could say, well, y'all did this deal. I need all my money. Rent me my money. Um, but they usually don't say that until they, until they get paid. So other things are just seller carried first and second deeds of trust. Sellers got a mortgage. They can, you know, if they don't have a lot of uh, debt on the property, they can carry financing. And then joint ventures, crowdfunding, preferred equity, raise, basically raising money from other investors. You can do that in real estate. That's another reason why it is, in my opinion, the best investment, because you, you can have the seller to assist you in the financing, or you can raise capital from other investors um, to acquire the property. And thus, getting you into the property with, with little to no money down. My first deal, y'all, was a six-unit apartment building in Pueblo, Colorado in 2003, as a, as a lease option to buy for $300,000, I, I did the deal with $1. That was my option consideration. And I had to borrow the dollar. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, we, real talk, but I made it happen. Now, I didn't make a lot of money on that deal. I didn't make any money on that deal. But you know what? That got me into real estate. I wouldn't change it for the world. That, that got me on a path that, what was that, 17 years later, I'm in this game. I'm fired up about this game. I'm fired about, up about where we are. Uh, I know that we're in this pandemic um, and, and dealing with all this pandemia, but I'm confident more than ever that there is a lot of opportunity. And this is what I have to say for black folks, particularly. This could be our opportunity to buy back our blocks. This could be our opportunity to get back in there, to roll our sleeves up and to go snatch some of the wealth that fell from up under us. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that the price is going to drop like they did in 2008. Although I don't know that. Um, what I am saying is the market's loosening up. I, I believe right now, today, we're in a buyer's market, especially for investment property. We are in a buyer's market. Um, and certain neighborhoods for residential has, remains to be seen. Um, but I think as things linger on, it will shift towards the buyers. It's been in the seller's market for the last few years. It's in the buyer's hands now. So this is our opportunity, y'all, to mount up to go and, and, and reclaim our, our spots. You know what I mean? In, in America, everybody has the right to buy wherever they can. So what we got to do is realize that our, our neighborhoods are valuable. Uh, our communities are even more valuable and we got to invest in them. So I'll wrap it up with that. And I would love to be able to take some questions, you know, um, with all of that. You know what, Steve? I, you know, I, I just wanted to say, you guys, he said, you guys, it's time for us to go buy back the block and he is absolutely right i see a lot of our agents that are on the um call you guys and i let you guys are on here you guys this is our time this is our time for you guys for our families for our community you guys to go and buy back the block and you guys you guys steve to me you guys you know you guys when it comes to buying you know probably that's like multiple you guys act an expert okay you guys i'm a realtor i'm a realtor but when it comes to you guys, multi-use you guys, I call Steve <laughs> because Steve is the expert, you guys. Okay, so um, let's. Um, that Dan, we have questions for Steve. Yes, we do. So one is, when looking at purchasing duplexes a few years ago, I never got my offer accepted because of cash offers or investors offering ten to twenty thousand over asking. What are some tips to get in this market? So here's the first thing. Uh, uh, Hey, a big part of the COVID situation, I mean, and it, it, it is a situation, but the reality of it is going to work to your advantage because that whole offers, multiple offers, some properties are getting that. Back only a few months ago, all the properties was getting that, and not all of them, but most of them that were priced reasonably. Where, where it, in order for you to get into that property, you had to come in strong over asking. Now, um, and I got a couple listings right now. I got investors asking for discounts. I got, you know, um, you know, we are negotiating as sellers. So as a person, for, probably for you who asked that question, it's probably best that you didn't buy that duplex at that time, because I think you were going to get a better opportunity to buy something here in the near future. Now, um, if you're in a situation where you're like in a market like a few months ago, right? 
and you really need to get a property because you got a bunch of cash, let's just say, you don't want to necessarily invest in the stock market or you already invest in the stock market and you're like, I want to get some real estate. The key for you then is to do your hardest to find a property off the beaten trail that is not on the market um, yet. Um, or if it is on the market, it's either overpriced or there's something unique about it. And so when you work with a broker or agent that you're working with, you let them know, hey, let's not only look at what's on the market, but let's try to find something off the market, something that might be in foreclosure or something that might be a vacant, abandoned, something where they might be willing to carry financing. Um, but you just need to pound the pavement in order to do that. But I'm here to tell you is that things are changing. And I think it's great that you didn't buy that duplex yet because you might be able to get a better deal in the coming months. Okay. And, but you still got to make sure that it, the numbers got to work. You know, the income and expense has to work and it's not going to be investors are not going to be coming in all cash over asking uh, right now. Investors, particularly now homeowners might. That's why I say in certain neighborhoods, like one of my, my friends was telling me about a property she lists in Santa Clara where she did get 15 offers and it went a hundred thousand over asking price. That's probably in a neighborhood where people are saying, I need to be in that school district um, or I need to be in that neighborhood or whatever. But investors ain't doing that. Not right now. You know, investors, are, you know, the world has lost trillions of dollars and investors typically in this type of market, they are become very tight and very shrewd about what they're doing because that's what that's how investors operate. You know, and I want everybody to think as investors, don't just because when you're bidding with people and you have to out whoever that was that outbid somebody 15, 100,000 over asking during COVID-19, probably not the wisest investment decision. But they might have needed that house for other reasons, because their kids need to go to that school or because their job is right there. So that's a different thing. But understand the market is changing. So that works for your advantage. And then um, if you're in this type of market and you can't find it, you have to look off the beaten trail, which is not easy, but it's very possible. And we do it on a consistent basis. Okay. Um, is a 1031 exchange only for investment property or does it apply to primary residence as well? Excellent question. And no, it is just for, or yes, it is just for investment property, your you know, second home or investment property. Anything that is considered your primary residence, you're not able to do a 1031 exchange. You do have the homestead exemption. Um, you know, I know there were some things tweaked with the, 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 uh, the tax, um, the Trump tax plan, but I know my understanding is the homestead exemption still remains in place. That's I think 200,000 in California, 250,000. I think it's federally 250,000 for an individual up to half a million dollars as a couple is, uh, is not taxable when you sell your, your personal residence, but no, unfortunately you're not able to exchange. Okay. After COVID layoffs and economic change, do you think a window of opportunity will open up for, new first-time investors to land a multi-unit at a below market rate. Absolutely. It's going to be your time to shine. Absolutely. It's your time to shine. You know what I mean? Now, I'm not saying it's going to be 2008 where the prices jumped off the map 70%. Um, but I do think today for the investors, it has become a, a buyer's market. Now, sellers today are not like right now on, what is it, April 29th, they're not giving away properties um, because ain't no, ain't no bank able to foreclose right now. There's no pressure on the sellers. Um, however, however, that, that is subject to change. Right now, everybody got a, now you own a mortgage um, in, in a home, let's say, or most people with investment properties got a 90 day, they got some, they got some 90 day love, right? No, no payments for 90 days, right? At the end of 90 days though, the, the bank wants to, the bank wants, at least uh, uh, most of the banks out there, they want all of their payments in one lump sum, three payments, 90 days, three payments in one WAP. Uh, or you can break it down over a period of time. When we get to that point, I think that's when we're going to see some stuff hitting the fan because some people will be able to make that payment. A lot of people won't. Okay. And then, then you'll start seeing people who have properties who are maybe selling like right now, they're like, oh, I'm stick to my price. I don't need to sell. There's not an urgency to sell. When things, when we get a little bit further along in this, that's when I think sellers will be a little bit more flexible. Again, I don't, they're not going to get a properties away for 70% off because in this market cycle, in order to get a loan, you actually had to qualify. You know what I mean? Last time it was, if you had 640 credit, you can get a million dollar loan and you just write down, I make 200,000 and you get the loan. 
nowadays you had to actually qualify. So people are not going to just walk away from their properties like they did before, but it's going to be some distress. It's going to be some, you know, uh, it's going to be some opportunities. So to answer that question directly, it is your time to shine. Uh, and if not now, at least for sure in the next couple, three months. Okay. Do you have a program or offer mentorship to new investors? Well, that's, that's a great question. I need to, right? I, I need to put together a, a, a <laughs> I need to put together more mentoring a, a program. You know, I haven't put one one together as of yet, but here's what I am doing in response to kind of what's going on. I am doing weekly content that I'm putting out on my YouTube station and I'm asking people to go to the YouTube because we are we are putting out weekly content. And then for people who want to be in a mentor, one thing is is anybody who I work with as let's say an investor a buyer or seller of real estate, I'm, I'm advising, I'm giving them my advice. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm saying as a fiduciary and I, I've been in this game for a minute. So I have seen some stuff. I know some stuff. Um, so if you want to, you know, tap in with me on the YouTube, you can add me on LinkedIn, go to LinkedIn, Steve Peterson, and, and let me know, Hey, you, you, you see me on this thing. Let's, you know, let, let, let's connect and do business. And if you stay in contact with me on my content, it will be valuable. But then if we're tapped in and we're doing business, you know, I, I can kind of walk you through the steps and maybe I, I should put together a mentor you know, program. I'm, I'm back, back in this pandemic. I'm in here. You know I mean? I, I, I saw somebody today. We running a school and a business from my house. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm coming up with all kinds of, you know, ideas, you know, cause I got these kids up in there. So I'm thinking, so maybe that is something I'll do in the future. And, and thank you for bringing that up. Okay. On average, how much do you need uh, for down payment for multi-units? So, Two, okay, two different things from two to four units, right? So if you're residential income, if you're an investor, it's like 20 to 25% down, okay, on average. Um, now, if you're talking five plus units, it's more like 30 to 35% down. You might be able to do it with 25% down depending on where you are in the country. Uh, and if you get like a Fannie Mae loan for apartments or Freddie Mac or FHA for apartments, you can get a little bit higher leverage. So you might be able to get get... 25% down, but on average, when you're talking five plus, you're talking 30 to 35% down, T uh, 20 to 25% down when you're talking two to four units. Okay. Uh, I purchased a home in SAC because I was not able to buy in the Bay, but I would like to purchase a multifamily in Oakland. Do you think it's just best to buy in SAC where it's cheaper? And do I have to wait three years before I buy because I use the FHA loan? Well, okay, good question. So first of all, SAC got real expensive, um, by the way. So SAC used to be cheap. Um, last couple of years, it got real expensive. So, um, but it depends, and it depends on a few things, like, you know, uh, where you're living, where you're working, where you're operating. Now, the Bay, Oakland, is, is a tough to get in. But let me just give you, I'm selling a property right now, 6516 Foothill Boulevard, four units, in Oakland, seven ninety nine is the price. I put it on the market two months ago. I had eight fifty, eight forty, eight twenty five. We of course took the eight fifty. The eight fifty actually came from one of the tenants who lived at the building. COVID hit. They all backed out, right? And now I'm bobbing and weaving. We just got an offer uh, under the asking price. We countered it, and we're gonna make a deal. It's probably not gonna happen at seven ninety nine. You know, what I mean, I told my clients that I'm keeping it a thousand. Um, they're not going to give the property away, but saying all that to say is I've been, I've been doing this for a year. We are flexible. We are negotiable in our price in Oakland. Um, so you may be able to find something in Oakland, the Bay over the next few months that might, might, might work for you. Uh, however, stock sack is also a great market. Um, just understand sack just shot up in values and what happens to, to sack a lot of times it also runs up and it runs down. Same thing like the Bay when it goes down. So I'm not saying it's going to shoot down, but I'm saying also you might find some great opportunities in Sacramento as well. The rents are not as strong, though. What was weird over the last couple of years that I would see apartment buildings at the same price per unit in Sacramento as in Oakland, but the rents is like half. So that's why I like Sac uh, Oakland more than Sacramento. However, I would say this. I like Stockton better than them both right now. I think Stockton is where, where it's at because they're building up the infrastructure out that way. And it's in between the Bay and, uh, and Sacramento. So it's a lot, got a lot going for it. But the key is just watch both markets, 
Make a decision based on your personal situation and use the fundamentals that I talked about to help guide you to make a quality decision based on return, not just because it's cheap. Because sometimes being it, it, the, the price point can throw you off just because you think it's cheap. Look at the income. Look at the vacancy. Look at the expenses. Look at your net. All right. And that'll help you to make a better decision. So if you can get in Oakland, get in Oakland. But also hear one more thing. The rental laws is a beast about here. You know what I mean? It is pro tenant, pro tenant, pro tenant. And, uh, you know, they, they, it, is, it is aggressive. So if you do buy something out here, you need to get a, 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 a property manager who know what they're talking about. I know a few realtors, uh, one in particular, um, you know, Maya Clark, who used to be the past president of uh, the media past president of ARPB. Uh, there's a couple other people, but Maya knows her stuff. Um, so if you do come out here, make sure you tap in with Maya Clark or a property manager who know what they're talking about. Okay, and for that person, does she have to wait uh, three years before she can buy because she used the FHA loan to buy her house? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I missed that piece of it. For investment property, no, um, you don't have to wait. Um, you just, you know, if you're just giving, getting a straight up loan, um, you you don't have to wait. Um, now, if you wanted to buy, now, if you wanted to buy another multi unit with an FHA loan. You also don't necessarily have to wait. You just have to move to that unit. You have to be moving to that unit. You, you can own an FHA fourplex, let's say, in Sacramento, and then move to Oakland and buy an FHA um, uh, fourplex in Oakland. Um, now, there are some parameters in regards to that. I'm not an expert on the FHA loan process, but I know it can be done, but, but it has to be your primary residence, if you, which you can do for two to four units, by the way. A great way to own a property that you live in is to buy two to four units because it's, it's both an, a residence and an investment. But you really got to show that you're moving into that unit because they know, they like, man, hey, I know a lot of people trying to maneuver with this. So you really have to show that you're moving into that unit. But if you're getting an investment loan, nah, you don't have to, you don't have to wait three years. You do have to put the 20% down though. And, you know, so that could be a factor. Okay. So I make 60K a year. Would that be enough to buy in Oakland? That's going to be tough to buy in Oakland. Um, um, not, you're not necessarily out of it, um, depending on what, okay, because, okay, when you're buying multifamily, let's say you're buying a fourplex, you get to use 75% of the rental income coming in from that fourplex to help you to qualify. The problem that you have today is, even on the lower end, you're going to be looking at six to 700,000 um, for that property. And so with that, the income from the building and your income, it's going to be, it's going to be tight today. Now that could change. I think we're beyond, and, and I got this video on my YouTube talking about analyze the market, the market. I think we're beyond the peak of the market. Uh, I don't think we will see a crash. I think we'll see a downturn of maybe five to 10%, maybe 10 to 15% of prices. Um, but it is not going to be like 2018, I, I mean, 2008. I really don't believe that. So, but even a 10% price adjustment, if something was 70, 700,000 would mean maybe you can get it at 630, uh, still be a little bit tight. You know, now another thing that we talked about yesterday on the panel I was on is co-buying. So uh, if you found somebody in your family or somebody you were cool with, you guys can go in together and buy uh, and qualify for the loan. And say you making 60, they making 40, or they making 60, you guys team up. That's an idea. Um, and again, something that is very prevalent in the Hispanic community, the Asian community, um, the, you know, maybe not, um, I say African, like my wife is from Ethiopia, the Africans, um, you know, from different countries out there, they team up and they buy property. So that's something that is African Americans that we need to start doing. Um, you know, a lot of our family dynamics are a little bit different, um, but at the same time, we got to start doing some things together, y'all. And that is an option to, uh, to be able to do it. So it's going to be tight. I don't want to discourage you because I believe anything is possible. Now, I also outlined some creative financing strategies. Okay, lease options, master lease options, um, installment sales. I believe more than price drops in this next market, we'll see sellers getting flexible. But because they have so much hard-earned equity in their property, they as a seller would rather carry financing than drop the price. So I do think that you might be able to work some creative financing deals. A lot of that, I think, would, and I think if sellers are smart and they got brokers that are smart, we'll see more lease options to buy. We'll see more uh, seller carried seconds and first mortgages as creative ways to get property sold. Um, 
but just on his face, it is tough as, with, with, with 60. Not impossible, though, but it's just going to be tough. Okay. Uh, do you recommend purchasing a multi-unit property prior to purchasing a single family home, or does it matter? <sighs> Tough one. Depend. Well, first of all, it depends on your family situation. Okay, I did that, you know, because I'm an. I've been buying investment properties before I even was close to being able to qualify for a home. In fact, um, some of the investment properties that I owned actually helped me to qualify for my for my um, for my home. Now, I didn't get a first. I didn't get what's called down payment assistance, and in some of the down payment assistance programs, you can't own rental property. However, you can absolutely get an FHA loan if because you know that's what I got when I bought my home 2015 January 2015 I closed on my home uh, and I live in the Oakland Hills now when I bought my home I got a FHA loan and I had at the time um, three four investment properties on my on my tax records that actually I was able to use the income from the property one of them was a flip so I, it didn't have income going but the other three were rental properties that was bringing in income that actually helped me out to qualify. And I'm able to show bank, you know, bank statements, tax returns and all that stuff that all went into helping me to qualify. I believe that's a great way to do it, but here's the deal. Okay. If you got a family, what I also believe is that family is first, right? Um, well, I, my, my priority is God, family, friends, and then friends and business, right? But family is over business for sure. So, your living situation, where you live and where your kids going to school at. Okay. If you ever had somebody come knock on your door and say, Hey, I'm sorry, I'm selling this property. I need y'all to get out or, Hey, I'm bumping that rent. Well, we live in rent control. So people can't, you know, depending on if the properties is in, but if you ever had somebody um, come and knock on your door and say, Hey, the rent is, it used to be 2000. Now it's 3,500. You got to go. That is a, that, that is a, that's a very difficult feeling and something to stomach, especially if you got to move school districts, you got to, so I always say home ownership is, is, is critically important. A lot of investors say just invest, 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 invest first. I think I would, I would invest in order to help you to buy something. But if you're in a situation where you need to take control of your home and where you live, um, going to get that, going to get that, um, at home. However, what about doing both what about buying a fourplex and moving in one of the units okay and then there you have your home and you have your investment all in one whop okay that's an also an option you know but you evaluate for yourself what's 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 best i bought investment property first that investment property helped me out um to actually to buy my home i think that's a great way to do it um but evaluate yourself your family your situation because family is first and control your housing situation we got to start doing that y'all Okay. And then are you familiar, familiar with Jay Morrison? What do you think about what group economics? Man, Jay Morrison is, is the man uh, right now. I mean, Jay Morrison is somebody who I follow for sure for a few years. Uh, we actually had Jay Morrison come out and keynote uh, our 2018 California uh, uh, Association of Real Estate Brokers State Conference in Oakland. Uh, met him and his wife. Um, what he's doing is amazing pioneer. Uh, he's the first one black, white, anybody to, um, successfully raise millions of dollars in what's called a tier two crowd fund, a crowd fund where the people can invest a lot, a lot of other crowd funds. You have to be what's called an accredited investor. Essentially you have to be a millionaire or make it over $200,000 a year to even qualify for those investments. So what Jay did is, is, is really open it up, um, for, People can invest in this fund with five hundred dollars. So what Jay is a, is a pioneer. I was seeing a couple people. He's he's closing the fund, uh, the the first round of the fund, and what that means just to get some clarity because there's a lot of confusion on the internet in the last few days. Some guy was like, "Oh, they closing the fund. Do we get our money?" What when he say he closing the fund? That means he didn't raise all the money. Uh, he ain't taking no more money for that fund. Now what happens the way funds work is. That is like the first round. Okay. He's going to probably, he's going to have another round of capital. I don't know all the details of how he's doing it. He's going to have another round of capital and then they'll go. But when he's saying, Hey, we're, 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 we're closing this entity, this particular fund. Um, that means you got to hurry up investor. You're not going to be in on that. And then I'm sure he, but, but he, I did see something today that they're talking about the next round 
that they are going to have. And if you have any sort of experience with venture capital, raising capital, things are done in rounds. Okay. So when Jay talking about, he closing the fund, he's not closing down business. You know, he's saying, hurry up invest because once they close it, you can't invest in it no more. And he's going to come up with another round where you can invest because the brothers, I mean, I think they've raised over $12 million um, from the people. So I, I believe in what he's doing. Uh, he's a pioneer in the industry. I follow him and I, I love that he's rocking with his wife. Uh, him and his wife are doing it as a team. Um, and, you know, I mean, I just, I just, I also, I love his content. I've been following him way before he uh, put the fund together, which is why we asked him to come out and talk to our people because he's from the streets and he turned his life around and he's spitting like he's spitting commercial game, investment game, real game that, a lot of us can relate to, especially I grew up in East Oakland. So all, most of my family was in and out of jail, dealing drugs. And it was such a blessing to see a brother like that, to really live that life, to come full circle and be doing what he's doing. I think he's, uh, 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 I think we'll be reading about him in the history books 20, 30 years from now. Okay. I don't see, actually one more question. It says, would you consider doing this here? I think that was in relation to whatever you, what you were just speaking about. I'm assuming. Yeah, actually, you know, I'm in the process of uh, forming an opportunity zone fund. So where I'm at, right, I'm doing this, um, the webinar right now from the chambers complex, uh, which is right on the border of Oakland and San Leandro. And I'm working with a gentleman by the name of Paul chambers, who's a, uh, uh, you know, a mentor of mine, um, but he's also been a client. He's a business partner. Um, and he's three generations deep in the construction business. And me, or, me and him are actually in the process of forming an Opportunity Zone Fund. We were smack dab, got our legal documents going, and then COVID hit. So we got a little bit of a delay. But we're, what we're doing is an Opportunity Zone Fund because we want to be able to invest in a tax advantage way into our neighborhoods. And with these Opportunity Zones that's going down, uh, it's, it's, it's a big opportunity for a lot of corporations to come and invest in opportunity zones, which is mainly black neighborhoods. Um, so they're going to invest because they can get some tax savings. Right. So what we have to do is we need to form these funds and we need to invest. We can't just say, oh, they coming in here and invest in. Oh, we can't do that because, you know, uh, money talks and everything else walks. We need to put up. We need to follow Jay's example and put dough together and make some things happen. So what we are doing is we're in the process of forming an opportunity zone fund, stay tuned, and we will be investing in Oakland, particularly DP East Oakland. That's, that's, that's home and that's where we're going, that's where we're going to rock at. Steve, thank you so much. I mean, I have people texting me <laughs> how wonderful this Money Table Talk is. You guys, yes, he will be back. Do not worry. You For guys, sure. he will be back. But you guys, in the meantime, um, Steve, once again, uh, let them know how, how they can contact you. Well, um, a couple, I want you guys to go to my YouTube station, Infinity Investments on YouTube, because that's where we're going to be, be hitting the contact. The content is going to be coming out, of, is coming out and will be coming out. But to personally connect with me, hit me up on LinkedIn or Instagram. So I'm Steve Peterson on LinkedIn. On Instagram, I'm Infinity Investments. I don't got no personal Instagram. My wife was tripping, um, but I'm just on there. <laughs> Uh, I'm on there as Infinity Investments on Instagram on LinkedIn and LinkedIn is the one I'm most active on because I, okay. I you know, so LinkedIn or Instagram, but really please go to the YouTube Infinity Investments to soak up this content. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Once again, thank you so much for being a money table talk. We appreciate you so much. And you guys, you guys, that's our goal to be a resource to help you guys build that solid financial foundation. And of course you guys need real estate to make that happen. Okay. Most so thank definitely. you guys all for being on Money Table Talk. We'll be, we'll be back tomorrow, you guys, our last day of April. Join us. You guys have a great evening. Bye, everybody. All right, y'all. Peace. Thank you, Blessings. Steve. All right, now. Bye -bye.